Okay, in this increment on Mark 13, I want to go through some things that I'm not done doing yet, but are part of how you validate your parsing of the text syllables. There are a number of built-in auditing methods that the Bible writers must have known because of the way they work. So you use them in order to make sure when you're counting syllables, if you're counting them right. Because as maybe you saw, like in Matthew, Matthew's sort of using a dialect in his writing, uh, full of a lot of Hebraistic pronunciation, which tends to run syllables together, like here, he, ye, ru. If you were a classical Greek person, you would pronounce it as three syllables. Hebraistic pronunciation, and especially because it's in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, it's just two. Ye, ru. All right, that's a Hebraism. And since Christianity, you know, um, spread pretty rapidly, it's to be expected that a whole bunch of people, even though they are Greek speakers, when they're thinking about Bible stuff, they use Hebraistic pronunciation. Like this should be. E O A N E S. If you are classical Greek, okay. But the Apostle John, even no matter how you are raised, you say Yohannes, because this in Hebrew is a Yo sound. You know, John, Johann, okay. That's where it comes from. Same thing for here, except that there's more variation here. Ya instead of Ia. Kobos. Okay, now here it's more important because so many people were named Jacob that they developed, um, both in Hebrew and in Greek, nicknames. Like when you see Jude, his name is really Jacob. His brother's name, James, right here, is also named Jacob. So they didn't call themselves Jacob. Jude calls himself Jude, which is short for Judas, which a lot of people stopped using after Christ died. Um, and James is another way to say Jacob. So when you see James, it'll be spelled in the Greek, Jacobos, and of course in Hebrew it'll be spelled Jacob. Alright? So these Hebraistic pronunciations are going to probably be in anybody's writing in Scripture in the New Testament, and therefore pronounced Hebraistically. But, for words like, and i got to show you this because that's going to lead to the next section of this increment. Kurios. Three syllables. Paul uses three syllables. Luke uses three syllables. Matthew, Hebraistically, treats the eo as yo. So it's kurios. So the syllable counts change due to that. So it's like, well, okay, but how do you know whether or not a dialect or Hebraism is really being used by a particular writer? And the answer is you don't. So you first map out the meter without, unless you absolutely have to, without respect to diphthongs. Did the writer count it as a diphthong or is he counting it as one syllable at a time? So you first map it out that way, and then once you map it out that way, you go back and you say, okay, well, I have to pronounce it as Hieru, because it's a Bible. It's written by somebody who's Jewish. It's written to Jews and Gentiles alike. So we're going to have to use that Hebraistic slant. Okay. And that's how I learned this. All right. I mean, Matthew is really pronounced. In Mark, it isn't. Mark is more of a, a classical Greek writer. Okay, so same thing here. This is Jesus. E, ye, Sus, three syllables to a classical Greek speaker. But it's Yeshua in Hebrew. Alright, so that's Yesus, two syllables. That's real important. Now, as I started to say about Kuriash, you'll notice that, that down here, it's in green, bold, and highlighted in yellow in the background. Versus this, which is just a footnote that I wanted to highlight. This is in green. Why did I do that? Well, as I started to say, to audit your syllable counts, Bible has certain built-in techniques that the writers all use to help you do that. And it's a really astonishing. 
Okay, I this if you want to prove that God exists, well, here you go. See this? Blip it. Blippish. Ide. I'm not sure he's doing it with Ide, but I am sure he's doing it with Blepis. Blepis. Alright, here's the next occurrence. Blepite. The distance in the syllable counts is divisible by seven. Matthew 24 does this with certain keywords like kurias, nunfias, hohuias tu teu, parousia, and amelego homi. The distance between, that's why I know Bezos' copy is right. The distance between this Amen Lego home in here and the one down here, as I sort of hinted at before, is divisible by seven. The syllable count differential is divisible by seven. See, look. Here you're doing it by clause because it leads the clause. 1078 is the syllable count. Sometimes they do it by actual occurrence between Amen and the next Amen. But here, by clause, I didn't count the actual distance between the Amens because I don't need to. See, here's the clause, 1078. That's the same number of syllables as in Isaiah 53. Okay, and then here, which is just after 63. So 1078 minus 63 is divisible by 7. In Matthew 24, 25, every time, and sometimes you have to count it from the beginning or the end, like I'm doing here. Here I'm counting it from one beginning to the end of the next one. But sometimes you're counting between the just the phrase itself. Sometimes you're counting that far. Sometimes you count this far. And I had to do actually a worksheet for the Matthew occurrences of the same phrase. Because there's six of them. And it's really, it's really important to do because if they're always divisible, if you have a lot of occurrences and they're always divisible by seven, then that means your likely syllable counts are right. And if they're wrong, they're wrong in between within the seven. So then you know how to audit your counting. That's what's so beautiful about this. Okay, so like blepetes, blepes, the blepete here is divisible by seven to the next one here is divisible by 7. So what that means is between here and here my total syllable counts are right. If there's any errors like you know maybe I should elide something together pronounce this you know as two syllables instead of one or whatever if so then there's going to be an offset before I get to the next blepete. It's like balancing a checkbook. That's how beautiful this is. And then, of course, here's the next one. Blepete again. All right, so between this blepete here and this blepete here, it's divisible by seven. So if there's any errors in my counting, they're offset by the time I get to the next blepete because it's divisible by seven. It means that the writer actually was paying attention to his syllable counts when he wrote. And for you as the reader, because remember, or the, the memorizer, because in, initially this text was, was put in writing, but people didn't carry it around with them. They didn't have computers like we do. They didn't have cell phones. They had to memorize the text. Because to have this written out, the media on which it would be written would weigh like 50 to 100 pounds. So even one, even just the Gospel of Mark, would have weighed something like 50 pounds, you weren't going to carry it around, so you memorize the text. Well, this helps you check your memorization of the syllable counts in the text. See, it's a validator. The syllable counts are, first of all, a validator. Validator of how you memorize the text. Validator that the person writing you is, is actually doing it from God. Because how can you be this smart? I'm dead serious. Think about how much time it takes just to do... I mean, I pasted most of the, This is all Greek text pasted from Bible works. Okay, it took me like seven hours just to do that. That was before I did the syllable counts. Okay, and decided, well, this is a diphthong. I mean, it took me all day just to, just to do, what is it, 37 verses. I was exhausted at the end. Absolutely exhausted. So, 
imagine what it would take to write it out and how do you count syllables while you're writing in such a manner that your distance is from that blepete to that blepete divisible by seven who is that smart dedicated you know good at getting it right you have to have God enabling it period I mean maybe you don't agree with that maybe you're the smartest person on the planet but honey I don't know anybody human who can do that because remember they're writing this out you know like first time all right so they're always divisible by seven in between so now I look at the division so I look at okay hi do I have an error between this blepete and this blepete in the syllable counts since the total is divisible by seven if I get a different count when I get to the end here then I got one that's overcounted one and one that's maybe undercounted one in each clause alright now here's my big question in Matthew that same kind of sevening distance is also used for Kurias, Nufias, Parousia, Hoahuias Tuteu and of course the famous Amen Lego Homi Paul did the same thing in Ephesians 1, except he used um, epinon, eudokion, telematos, propikotas, protesin, and proeteto. In other words, each writer is picking his keywords, and he's making sure that the distances between them are seventh. Now, it has another meaning that I haven't yet gotten to, but this is just so that you can prove your syllable counts. Huias is used in Matthew 24. So is somehow the distance between it and maybe I'm in Lego Humin divisible by seven? I don't know. I didn't check. And idete is a synonym, horao, is a synonym for blepo. Blepo means to look at or see to it, really, is the way it should be translated here. Horao kind of means to observe, watch, okay? And it's used a lot here. All right, so is there some kind of like seven distance between this and this between this and this you see between the similar keywords is there a seven in distance that's used as a sort of auditing checker all right I don't know I haven't done all the math yet on this but I just want you to see because when you go to do a passage you got to find the keywords because it's going to have this thing and I thought thought well maybe smion is used that way too because the sign is something you see I don't know I haven't counted yet is the distance between smion and blepete here smion and blepes up here is that is that distance divisible by seven I don't know it might be though okay that's what I wanted to get across now there is another use and it's particularly important in Matthew 24 so that's why I wanted to make sure I checked it in Mark and why I know this is deliberate in Mark it's not just one occurrence it's two the scholars think there's only one occurrence and they consider this one in Beza's copy to be detography which means you know copying something twice that you know you only need to copy once uh-uh it's deliberate again because it's sevens see that indicates intent if the distance is seven, then it indicates that somebody did it on purpose. You'd have to count the syllables to make that distance that way. You get that, right? Okay, but in Matthew, this is particularly important because every time Christ says, I'm in Lego Humi, the distance to the next occurrence of the phrase is divisible by three or seven on purpose. Three, of course, is Trinity meter, so it stresses that Christ is God and it stresses the unity of the Trinity in their will on a particular event. Okay, but it does have one other function. And Paul uses it the same way. Between occurrence of this particular thing, it's called an anaphora. The Greek term for it is anaphora. Refrain. Okay. Um... The occurrence between the first one and the second one is, and the next one is not only divisible in Matthew 3 or 7, but it brackets a period of history. Now here we've only got two of them, but if there were three, the third occurrence, pretend the third occurrence was right here, okay? 
then the distance then this would be the third occurrence this would be the second one it would be the second one that is deemed to be the centerpiece of the whole historical text that's being laid out as a prophecy okay so if there was a third occurrence here this would stand for 1281 plus 30 and then the text that would be most important determining the entire meaning of the content point of it would be here in the middle saying that something happening during the Crusades was vital to the whole story. Now we don't have a third one here. So what I just told you was just a hypothesis to show the style. But we do have a third one in Matthew. So I'm going to show you that. Oh no, don't tell me my... See? Yeah. See this, this is the... Uh, I'm revising it again, but I want you to see this. See here's the first occurrence. This is Matthew now. First occurrence, again, it's 63, just like it is in Mark. That's why we know that it's on purpose. That's why we know Bezos' copy is the right one. For just that phrase. Okay, here's the second time it occurs. All the way down here. And I think this is three syllables off, but I haven't proved it yet. I think that's supposed to be a 1085. Because this is supposed to be an 1113, but there are no variants here that I can add three syllables. Okay. See, here's the second occurrence. All right, so, so the first thing that you know is, okay, when Christ is giving this prophecy and Matthew's repackaging it, I'm supposed to make a point about 63 years to the pre-church millennium, which was 94 A.D., something between 94 A.D. and... 1140 or 1148 is important in the history of this prophecy. It's a theme of the history. Okay? So then I have to look at, well, what was so important about that period? Alright? With respect to Bible, with respect to Jerusalem, with respect to the temple, with respect to whether believers are salty or saltless. I'd have to look up all those themes in history and say, well, what, what's being stressed? Now, why does that matter? Because the third occurrence is what makes it clear. Right here. There's six occurrences of this phrase in the Matthew text. Six. This is the third one. It's center. And Paul did the same thing in Ephesians 1. It's center. That's 1540. That stands for 1570 A.D. What's so important about 1570 A.D.? Well, if you spend any time studying history, you know, oh, that's the year that the papacy excommunicated um, Elizabeth I, and that's really when the English Reformation started. So what's the text that's supposed to talk about that period in history afterwards? I will, I will put them in charge of everything. The master will put that person who's the good servant in charge of everything. That's the need, media context here, and this is all the Reformation right here. It's all the Reformation, like this, this is Wycliffe, and uh, who's he, what's his, um, Hus, Jan Hus. This is our boy uh, Zwingli, and Erasmus, and Luther, and sort of Calvin, a little bit, in there, okay? This one, I'm, I'm sorry, it started up here. No, this one is um, Wycliffe and Hus. This one is Wingley and Erasmus and Luther, rather. Okay? This one is John Knox and John Calvin. Okay? This, oh, I almost died when I found this. This is Tyndale. See? The theme of the text is who's a good servant. This is how I know what to tell you about 2016. Every time you see Kurios, it's referring to something to do with Bible translation, Bible dissemination, some really major find of Bible text itself, and teachers. Okay? Something big, not little. Alright? Um, and Lego Homing then puts those things in the context of big Bible freeing up, big Bible dissemination to people, and that's exactly what the Reformation was. And it's the centerpiece of all six right here. So by careful placement of these anaphora in a prophetic passage, you're being told what's the centerpiece of that future history, and therefore the theme of it. 
the Reformation. What was the Reformation? The big deal in the Reformation was two things. Number one, the papacy was lying about how you got saved. And number two, they were keeping the Bible from you. And ever since the Reformation, being able to get the Bible has been the number one topic and the number one freedom the world has known. We did not have that freedom after Christ died. For It was there. And then, as he tells you right up here, see when he says, people are going to come in my name. Don't be deceived. A lot of people are going to come in my name. That's when the Bible started to be kidnapped. This is a kidnapping story about the Bible. Alright? The Bible starts to get kidnapped here. Jews start to get persecuted and their Bibles burnt up so that nobody can find them. And all you get is the Latin Vulgate from that point on. Because that stands for 199 AD. That's when the old Vulgate started to be published. And you wouldn't be able to get a Bible, nor could you learn the Greek. The only place you could get the Greek was in, in university. So people stopped speaking it. So you couldn't read the Bibles that were out there. Okay? The whole Christianity started to really corrupt big time at this point. People speaking in his name instead of you being able to get his word. Okay, so now do you understand why the second anaphora matters? Because the second anaphora is basically about people rebelling against the papacy. And one of the rebellers actually becomes a pope. I forget his name. It was a Cistercian monk from England or France who was friends with the guy who was the head of the Cistercian monks in England. So, see, England and France are really being highlighted starting in here. And then here, this is all about the English Reformation. Not just any Reformation, but the rest of the Reformation is recorded each time as, the, as God coming. The Lord comes, because that's what they asked about. What are the signs of your coming? Yeah, well, I'm coming here. I'm coming here through Bible. God comes to you through Bible. That's number six, ask any Jew. Okay? And this particular thing here is the 1611 King James and the three revisions that followed it. Plus, there were a whole bunch of new Greek texts that came out. Plus, um, there was the beginning to be back to positive volition toward the Jews which Oliver Cromwell is going to reverse and this is the time when the reversal starts that's uh, Charles who was James the first son and he wanted to recapture the Bible and the, and the England said no 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 they deposed them so they went for the real Lord instead of him trying to be their replacement Lord that's the big key the replacement Lord. Charles wanted to be the replacement Lord for the Bible to dictate it to them and the English said no, no and opposed them. They wanted the real Lord and the real Bible instead of him. And that is seven. In, every time this occurs the distance is divisible by seven between the last occurrence of Hope Curious and the next one. You can count the syllables yourself. I did a post on it in Frank Forum. Same thing with Amen Lego Humin Hote and this put ho well not necessarily Hote. Um, the Biza the Biza Codex puts Hote on the next line. So maybe don't count the Hote, put the Hote on the next line. This syllable count will still end up being the same. But this might be fifteen thirty eight, which is fine. Okay, it still has the same meaning. Because it's covering the whole period. Okay, so then the next time it occurs, this is our time now. The next time it occurs is right here, so it's pretty important to know the last time it occurs. This is the 2000th anniversary of the Lord's death, 2030. And beginning in 2030, something dramatic is going to happen in the world regarding Bible. And it runs until 2006, because you'll notice Hoti is not used here. And one of the dramatic things is going to be the repudiation of Christianity. I don't know you. Why? Because all the foolish virgins have come back. Remember? The prepared ones went behind the doors with Christ. In other words, we're busy studying. We're not politicking. Alright? And only the foolish ones are there. And the foolish ones wanted to take the oil away. This is World War I. Want to take the oil away from the wise ones. Finally, the wise ones, World War II, 
answer them and say, go away, go buy it yourself. Okay? See, these are the foolish ones. And, okay, so they're on their way to buy it. Alright? They're on their way to buy it. Just as they're leaving, the very loud bridegroom is coming. See? Here's bridegroom. The distance between that and that is divisible by seven. Divisible by seven. Divisible by seven each time. So we know I got the syllable counts right. So the stupid, the stupid, you know, non-filled with the spirit, politicking Christians are leaving just as the bridegroom comes. I'm sorry. Yeah. They're leaving. They're leaving. See, he comes and they go behind. I'm sorry. What's that? Where, where was that? Where, where was it? Yeah. Where was it? I, I was picking the wrong. Wait a minute. Ah, yeah, here it is. Sorry. Just, just as the foolish virgins are leaving, here comes the bridegroom. Now, in the ancient world, when a bridegroom arrives, there's a lot of songs and timbrels and noise. But the politicking Christians who are busy trying to have Caesar instead of God, they don't hear him. So he goes in with those who are actually learning and living on Bible, and he closes the door with them. Later on, that means later on in Greek, back come the foolish virgins. And this is comes to our year now. Okay, this is 2015. 2015 is here. This is the rise of the Tea Party, okay? This is 20, 2009. When Obama first takes over. That's when the Tea Party rises and all they do is talk, 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 talk. And what do they want? They want Caesar, not God. So they call Caesar the Lord. Lord! Lord! That was 2016. They said, Lord to Donald Trump. They even made books like, Ann Coulter wrote a book saying, In Trump We Trust. Cheeto Jesus. I mean, there's, you know, the memes that are in, all over Twitter with by Trump supporters saying, Oh, God wanted him. God appointed him. Go to rightwingwatch.org and see all the reports that they that they pass on by Christians claiming that oh tr Trump is the hope of the nation. Trump is prophesied by God. Trump is our savior. Yeah, Lord, Lord. Yeah, and we're stuck with him right now. And that is 2017 and that is 2018 and what's interesting about that is where's 2019? 2017, 18, 19, 2017, first year, 2018, second year, 2019, third year, 2020, new president would be inaugurated. Oh, but this only goes to 2018. Yeah, so maybe Trump doesn't live that long or maybe they give up on him. And they go after some other Lord saying, open to us. Yeah, the real Lord they don't want to listen to. You see where I'm getting the interpretation? So, when we go back and we see, okay, this is about the Reformation freeing up a Bible so everybody can actually learn it again like they did in the first century. Something of magnitude, I don't know what yet, repudiates those Lord, Lord Christians. Alright, repudiates them. Because this text in Greek says, I don't know you. So the Lord is really going to speak in some kind of historical event. We'll all know it's him. And what he's going to be saying to these idiots is, I don't know you. Why are you knocking on the door? You're knocking on the door of politics. I'm the real Lord. You're knocking on some fake Lord. See, false Christ, that was the theme from the beginning of Matthew. Don't be deceived. There are going to be a lot of false Christ. Yeah, here they are now in the White House. They even call themselves by an obviously false Christ name, Seven Mountains. Go look up Revelation 17 and Seven Mountains. These people are so stupid about Bible, they think Seven Mountains is a good thing. But if you look in Revelation 17, you'll see God condemns it. And here's where that condemnation starts. I don't know you. You're saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. 
by your good deeds, by your fake doctrine, by your hating God. In the name of God, you say, open to us like what? I don't know you. In the Roman world, this was nasty. This would be like you had a daughter. She ran away with a boy that you didn't want her to marry. And then she comes back and she knocks on your door saying, open to me. And you disown her. Now, you can't lose your salvation, but you sure can lose God, God's favor. Because a, a parent has to discipline his kid. So the Roman patriarch would open up the door and there would be his daughter probably all dripping wet saying, Oh, my husband left me. Let me in. And the patriarch looks at her and says, You made your own bed, honey. I don't know you. That's what this is. This is a repudiation of political Christianity right here. And it's upcoming. And it's going to run a while, as you can see. Because see, this is 2017. And by the time this I don't know you business ends, it's 2041. You see, this is where I'm getting it from. And the Amen Lego Humin is what helps me know it. Now, it occurs again two more times, but this is so far in the future, I don't know how to read it. It's bad. That's all I can tell you. See, there it is again. And then here's the final time. But I don't know how to read those. Okay, I don't know how to read those. So now we come back to Mark. And we got it here. And I do know how to read that. Okay, I've been talking about it already. It's just basically still the same meaning. What I don't know is, is there a sevening distance between this and Hohuias? Lepete? And Hokurias? There might be. There might not be. I'm not sure that it's supposed to be. But the point is, the sevening distance tells you something first about your syllable counts and second about the importance of the historical period because as we just saw in Matthew, and it matters to us because we got to deal with it. Okay? It's upcoming now for us right here. In 2036, 2030 to 2036, we're going to have to deal with this. It matters to know what it is. And it has to do with Reformation. Because it's the only time the text is praised and it's the whole theme of the prophecy. is the getting of Bible. Getting or kidnapping of Bible and people you know, speaking in Christ's name and they're not speaking for Him, they're lying. Like when I'm talking to you now, you're supposed to examine, if you're supposed to even listen to me, you're supposed to examine, well, is Brain not telling the truth or lying or just flat wrong? And you'll have to test it to know if you're even supposed to listen. So, since we already know that from Matthew, it's not too hard to figure out that we're supposed to know it in Mark too. Only he's marking a different period, and why is he doing that? And the answer is, I don't know. Okay. What is the importance between 94 AD here, and there's only two of them. So I don't have a third as a center, um for historical trends. I don't have a center. I've got 94 AD to the Crusades. What was so important about that that he's going to mark it with Amen Lego Humin in those places? And the answer is, we'll have to find out. But I don't know now. But hopefully you see, oh wow, this is really important for vetting whether or not you counted your syllables rightly and for vetting the interpretation of the text. Isn't that what prophecy is for? It's not meant to be mysterious. It's meant to be known. And the reason why the language is so kind of odd is because it's full of meaning and you have to keep your syllable count slow or short and you want it to be dense and packed and enjoyable. So it's very pithy. That's why it's kind of hard. It's like, well, what is it? The, the, each one based on his work? Oh, no, nah, that can't be. You can't work for your salvation. So then what does this mean? Okay, well, if you don't know the historical underpinning and the 70, well, then you don't know where to even begin to know what it means. You see the point? Hopefully I've helped. If not, yell at me.